as we have said, as we've studied the book of uh, Romans, um, Paul's uh, discussion about uh, salvation being based upon justification by faith, uh, faith alone, uh, would be problematic to a Jew who uh, thought faith was based, or salvation, as it were, was based on faith in God uh, and then uh, obedience and observance of the Torah. Pretty simple. That was their paradigm. That's how they looked at the world. And here comes Paul, a rabbinical scholar uh, who's converted to Christ and following Christ as the Messiah, who's telling him, oh, no, no, you're saved by faith in Christ alone in God's courtroom. He declares you righteous based on faith. It's got nothing to do with Torah obedience on a perpetual basis. This is news to them. Well, what about all of our feasts? What about all, the, all of that? And so Paul, in uh, chapters 9 through 11, uh, this, these three chapters specifically address questions that Jews would have. Uh, and Paul's stopping as a Jew to say, let me address questions that you in the church uh, would have or do have regarding uh, justification by faith and how it relates uh, to you as a Jew uh, because it led to many questions. We've studied seven questions so far over the last several months. Today we're going to look at question number eight uh, that they have. And by the way, when you look at scripture, if you read scripture, you probably walk away having a question or two, don't you? I mean, I do. When you're reading, you're thinking, what in the world does that mean? Uh, and, uh, and so God is not afraid to hear your questions if you want to articulate those to him. Uh, he he's loves to give you answers in a variety of ways, sometimes through a sermon, uh, sometimes through a song, sometimes through a life event. He gives you answers to those questions if you pay attention. But I won't go through the seven questions that we looked at thus far. I will mention to you, because it's been two weeks, and... Um, uh, you might have forgotten what he talked about in uh, verses 1 through 11. When Paul was looking at verses 1 through 11, um, he's, he's answering a question. Uh, uh, the, uh, the question from the Jews then was, has the historical pattern of disobedience between God, his people Israel, in the Old Testament, has that historical pattern of disobedience uh, cost them their nation? Uh, was God completely finished with them? And so Paul spends those 11 uh, verses, as we saw two weeks ago, uh, talking about, uh, that nothing thwarts God's redemptive plan toward Israel, uh, but they still have questions about that because their sin was great, and they knew, and they knew that because they had rejected the Messiah, the ultimate rejection. And so when you get to chapter 11, verse 11, uh, Paul's going to entertain further in more depth uh, the question about Israel's position before God. And you might be sitting here thinking, I'm a Gentile, what has this got to do with me? Uh, it's got everything to do with you because he's going to talk to you specifically here in this chapter and talk to you about your attitude toward Israel. Because if you look at our politicians today, uh, any, more and more so at an alarming rate, they're looking at Israel as the problem to the world, not the solution to the world. This is not biblical. Uh, and it's prophesied to happen that the world will be anti-Semitic prior to the return of the Messiah, but the church should not be anti-Semitic. Uh, we should be for them. Why? Because Paul is going to say, God is not finished with them as a people. Uh, therefore, God's people, Jew and Gentile, who are saved in the church age, should be for them because God's not finished with them. So this is a very uh, powerful passage of how to have the mindset of God. Uh, and our culture is abandoning that at an alarming rate. And God's going to tell you the solution to the world is salvation of the, of the Jew, who then ushers in the kingdom of the Messiah. We'll get into that at about 140 today as we get there. So, <laughs> are you with me? Yeah. And so, what's the question? Uh, question number eight. Has Israel's sinful ways made her unredeemable? Now, if you're a Gentile looking at that, uh, same ap applicable to you too. Because if you're not a Christian, you can be saying, you cannot believe the sin I have committed. There's no way God would forgive someone like me. Well, wrong position. Because, yeah, yeah, he would forgive you. Uh, he would totally forgive you. He forgave Paul who was a murderer, uh, killed people uh, that were Christians. God forgave him. God will forgive you. So nothing will thwart the redemptive purposes of God to redeem, and nothing will thwart God's redemptive purposes toward his nation Israel either. And so he's going to answer that question in a definitive format uh, in the passage before us. So verse 11, uh, he says, Paul says, a uh, typical question I get, he says, from uh, Jews is this. I say then, based on what I just said about Israel's sin in the first 11 verses, uh, historically speaking, their penchant for walking away from God. Did they stumble this time? So as they, they fell, I mean, fell hard, that it's over. Uh, I'm adding to the text if you're wondering where those words come from in the Bible. This is what he's saying. I mean, do we commit the ultimate sin when we rejected the Messiah? Now it's over for us as a nation. That's the question from the church in Rome. Uh, they had historically turned against God. Uh, if you read the Old Testament, uh, this summer, well, what is this? This is, we're still in July. Is that true? What is today's date anyway? 28th. Is it 28th? Okay, we're still in July. Um, 
So for like about the last month, month and a half, I've been reading uh, for my summer devotions in my Hebrew Bible, the book of Exodus. And I don't read Hebrew as fast as I do English for obvious reasons. It looks like chicken scratch and it takes a while. It would take you a while too, wouldn't it? And you know, so I'm just kind of moving my way through. I'm in chapter 16. Uh, and what I've been noticing in reading it again is just uh, two words keep popping up. Two words keep popping up, which I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Complain and grumble. <laughs> Not that you ever do this as a Christian. Why did God permit that? Why did he let that happen? That's complaining and grumbling. Complaint and grumble. And it happens after chapter, well, it happens at the end of chapter 15, going into post-Exodus activities. So you would think, logically, if you're the Jew in captivity for hundreds of years, that if God allowed this old man Moses with a staff and his sidekick, Aaron, to, to use this staff to do amazing things to destroy Israel's hold on you as a nation. I mean, I'm talking amazing miracles that are going to attack the Egyptian pantheon, all 10 of them. Like afflicting the Nile River, turning the river. Did you see the movie when he sticks the... Yeah, sick, I love that part. I've seen that thing, I don't even know how many times. Cecil B. DeMille knew how to do it. Did he not? He sticks the staff in the Nile and it just begins to... Everything turns to blood. I mean, could you imagine? I mean, the power of that, the multiplication of the frogs, the, all the stuff. He's, he's judging the pantheon. You would think if you saw all 10 of those things and you're the Jew, you'd be thinking, God's totally got this. Yeah. Right? Uh, well, then you get to the exodus, you know, the, uh, the parting of the water. And you saw that in the movie? Awesome. I mean, we see the, the, the waves kick up and all of a sudden the water starts peeling back and it peels back and it's, you know, a couple hundred feet deep and the water dries up in front of them and the Egyptian chariots are coming at them and they walk all two million of them out into the, the dry riverbed and then they walk across onto the other side and then here come the chariots. I think Yul Brenner, remember him? Yeah. He was like Ramses or something like that. Here he comes. I like Yul Brenner, by the way. Yeah. Magnificent seven, etc. You remember? Anyway, back to the sermon. So, you know, here they come with the chariots and, and then they're standing on the other side and then, you know, Moses raises up the, the, the staff and behold, watch the power of God. <sighs> Sound effects. Water begins to implode, buries all the Egyptians. And you would think if you saw all that, 11 miracles of an major nature, you would think on the other side, you would think to yourself, no matter what happens, God has this. And then you run into chapter uh, 15, verse 24 and following. No sooner are they in the desert on the other side than they begin to complain. What are we going to drink out here? <laughs> you know, oh, so you found a spring, huh? It's kind of bitter. Uh, it's kind of bitter. What are you going to do to make it uh, like sweet? You know, you know, throw a tree in it or something amazing. Uh, you know, they begin to complain and they begin to grumble. And uh, do a word search on the words, grumble and complain. Why are they complaining and grumbling? Can you relate? Do you ever grumble and complain about what God permits in your life? You should be looking at that going, oh, God's totally got this. But that's what they did. So when you look at their history, it's not one of stellar obedience to God. It's like, give them, give them a choice. The majority is going to choose to complain and grumble. There's always a remnant who's a minority, like Moses and Aaron and etc., that follow hard after God. But the majority, uh-uh, they didn't. And then now the Messiah has come. And he's fulfilled all of the prophecies, all 60 exact prophecies to the letter. And he does them all. And what do they do? They get to the last week of his life and they chant two words. Or really three, three words, but, but you know, they're chanting over and over again those two words, Cru crucify him. We don't want him as our king. And they, they crucify their Messiah. So the, the, the point being, because we've really stumbled and rejected the Messiah, does that mean that God is done with us as a nation? Uh, Paul's answer is really short. This could be a really short sermon. It's not your lucky day. Uh, it could be a short sermon. Here's what Paul says. His answer in uh, chapter 11, verse 1 is, may it never be. Well, we have that verse somewhere, but may, may it never be. Now, I told you two weeks ago, you should underscore this, write this in your Bible. One guy did in the last service, wrote down the Greek. Totally amazing. Uh, I told you to memorize this. It's the most emphatic statement in Greek. Paul uses it multiple times in Romans to say no way with an exclamation point. No, you know, way. That ain't happening. Meganoito is what he says. He says, God finished with his people. Did they fall so hard this time? They rejected the Messiah. God's done with the nation. Is he done with Israel? What's Paul say? May it never be. Meganoito. It's not happening. It is not happening. It could never happen. Why? Because they are his people. So, 
if you look at the, the main motif of the verses 11 to 24, Paul's telling them again that the sin of the people cannot thwart the redemptive purposes of God for the nation. It cannot. Why? Well, he's going to answer that in a threefold format uh, as we're going to see starting in verse 11, the last part of the verse. But he's going to say this could never happen. God is not done with Israel. So our world might think Israel is the problem and Paul's saying, oh no, they're the solution. They must be saved as a nation. They're going to be saved. Let me illustrate how they are saved. Uh, he's going to give them uh, three answers. Uh, answer number one, why is God not finished with them as a people? Number one, he's going to say uh, in verses 11 to 15, her sin as a nation points to their ultimate belief, which is totally ironic. They rejected the Messiah, but the day's going to come when they embrace the Messiah as a nation and get saved. And, and if you want some uh, additional reading to validate that point, just read Zechariah chapter 12. Chapter 13, specifically, because uh, it talks about Israel being saved. So notice what Paul says in verse 11. But by their transgression, s salvation has come to the Gentiles. For what purpose? He's, the little purpose clause. What's the purpose of God going after the Gentile? Well, what's he tell you the purpose is? To make who? Jealous. Jews. Jews. Jealous. Over what? The fact that God's saving Gentiles. Isn't this interesting? God takes a tragedy, the rejection of the Messiah by his own people. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. He takes that and says, okay, I will discipline you for a while, but I will take your unbelief and I will turn it and I will go after people you never thought I'd go after. I will save the goyim, the Gentiles. And that's exactly what he does. See, God can take uh, your, your greatest sins and turn them to great things. That's what he does. Uh, he says, I want to do this to make Jews jealous of what the Gentile has. Did you realize that if you're a Gentile, that uh, you should live your life in such a fashion that if there's a Jew around you, that they should be able to look at your life and come to the Messiah by how you're living. Because your life is so amazing, they look at you and say, what have you got that I don't have? I mean, I led my wife to Christ, maiden name Solomon. Shortened to Sally, S-A-L-Y, when they immigrated from Germany. I think Solomon's Jewish, don't you? You know, and, and this, I began to share Christ with, G, with, uh, with Liz, and she trusted Christ in the summer of 79. And then, then I got engaged right after that. I mean, it's like great. And then I led her sister to Christ before she died in 1993, when she was 33. Uh, I led her sister to Christ one day in a car. She looked at me and she said, Marty, you and Liz, you do not make what me and my husband make. We have a million dollars in the bank. We have a Jaguar, a BMW. I mean, we have all this stuff and you don't have what we have. But why is your marriage qualitatively different than our marriage? And I told, I told Mary Beth one thing. His name is Christ. Do you know him? See, she's je jealous of what do you have that, that we don't have? Well, I have a relationship with the Messiah. See, so you live in such a way that you lead them to Christ. And Paul said, that's what God has done. So her sin points to the fact that God is not finished. He's still working to lead them to himself in faith. Dr. Charles Feinberg is long since dead uh, and with the Lord. But uh, he used to teach the Old Testament in Hebrew at Talbot Seminary. Uh, an awesome brain of a man and a great writer. Uh, I have a lot of his books. Uh, he's one of my favorite people to read. Uh, his books are meaty. In fact, uh, before I came here, they quit selling them in the Christian bookstore where I was in Northern California because they said his books were so meaty, people didn't buy them. I'm like, are you kidding me? They're awesome to dig into. Uh, Dr. Feinberg was uh, raised in a Jewish family that was uh, uh, totally observant of Jewish uh, feast, feast rules and laws and traditions, etc. Uh, and when it came to a Friday evening when Shabbat started, uh, they were a family that observed the, the Shabbat rules not to work on the Sabbath. So they hired a Gentile lady to come into their house uh, in the evenings on Shabbat, Friday evening until Saturday evening, and they called her the Shabbat Gentile, the Sabbath Gentile. Her job was simple. You do all the work so we don't break the law of working on the Sabbath and we'll be good before God, but you just do all the work. So they brought her in. So she began to work and a Christian lady, she was, and she began to work and, uh, you, know, you know, work like a Christian lady should work and she began to talk to the, the, the children, etc., like Charles. And Charles began to ask this Christian woman theological questions. Well, eventually her questions uh, got to the level where she, they were probably to use DC language, above her pay grade. And so she, she said, well, I have someone you need to talk to. Uh, she said, I want to introduce you to another Jewish man. His name is John Solomon. 
Uh, and John Solomon uh, was Dr. John Solomon. Uh, and he was a converted Jew who was the head of the American Board of the Missions to the Jews. <laughs> uh, this is somebody to talk to. So Charles said, yeah, I'd love to talk to him. So he did. Multiple conversations. Guess what happened? Dr. Solomon introduced Charles to the reason why Christ is the Messiah. And Charles embraced the Messiah. How'd that all start? With a maid a maid, a Shabbat Gentile. You have to stop and ask yourself, am I, as a Gentile, a Shabbat Gentile? What does that mean? That means you're willing to live your life in such a way before people of uh, uh, Jewish nature that they can see the Messiah through your lifestyle and come to Christ because they're exposed to you. Is that true of you? Or are they driven away from the Messiah because of your lifestyle? Paul says, uh, be, be the kind of Shabbat Gentile that leads people to Christ because God's not done with his people. God wants your life to make them jealous so they come to him. Notice in verse 12, he says, um, if they're, he's going to say, think about this. He says, if their transgression is the richest for the world um, and their failure is the richest for the Gentiles, meaning we got to know the Messiah through the abandonment of the Messiah by the Jews, how much more will the fulfillment be? I mean, he says, think about it. If we, uh, if you, you as Gentiles got to be part of God's family and you weren't part of his family before, imagine what it will be when they as a nation come to know the Messiah, which leads to the premise, is God done with Israel? No. No, he has plans for them as a nation. So Paul goes on to say, verse 13, he says, but I am speaking to you who are Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. I love what I do. And then he says, if somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and to save some of them. Paul says, my heart is for my Jewish people. I used to be lost and didn't follow the Messiah, but I now live in such a way as I minister to Gentiles that Jews can look at what I'm doing and saying, Man, what's, what's, what's going on with Paul? What's he talking about? He says in verse 15, if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? See, they're a dead nation now, spiritually speaking, but he says, what's going to happen when the nation gets saved? Again, I go back to the premise. Is, is God finished with Israel as a nation? No. What's our culture say? Oh, they're the problem. What's God say? They're not the problem. They're the solution. Because when they get saved as a nation, wow, what's going to happen on the planet then? Well, this is job security for me because these are topics to infinity. <laughs> I mean, think about it. I mean, there's too much to even dive into. But it leads to the question, which we've got to ask, uh, you know, because it's so important. Well, if God isn't finished with the nation, when does the nation come to know him? And we'll talk more about that next week, but it's too exciting. We've got to talk about it this week, right? And so when does, the, when does Israel come to know God? Because um, I've been there many times. They don't, as a nation, know God. Many of them are secularized, atheistic, agnostic, etc. Um, well, Zechariah chapter 12 prophesies that at the end of time, Jerusalem will be made the focus of world attention. Check. <laughs> Check. You can't even go through a given week and not see they're a focus of world attention. God says, I'm going to make them the focus of the world, but it's an anti Semitic focus. But then you get to chapter 13, uh, as you read 12 and 13, where it says that God is going to come back and when they see him and the nail prints on his hands and in his feet, when they see him, that they will then fall before him and embrace him as Messiah. When's that happen? Well, that happens at the end of the tribulation. The seven-year tribulation that Revelation talks about. At the end of that, at utter darkness, when all the armies of the world, the Chinese, the Iranians, everybody's gathered to wipe out Israel, in that black darkness, when the luminaries are turned off, in the total dark, cosmic darkness, is when the sky opens, God's dimension breaks into our dimension, the Shekinah glory shows, and Christ shows up on a horse, followed by, well, the armies of heaven and the church of God. And he comes back to save his people. That's when they see him and they turn to him. Paul says, what is going to happen when the nation turns to him? I mean, well, what's going to happen? He's going to save them. Not every single one of them. We know that from Christ's parabolic teaching. But when the nation is saved, the majority of them are saved, the kingdom of the Messiah starts, the Davidic empire. That's another awesome sermon topic. But we know God's going to set up his kingdom. He says so all throughout the Old Testament. Isaiah 2 is a great case in point. That Christ comes to rule and reign from Jerusalem. And the nations will flow to Jerusalem to learn from the Messiah. Zechariah 14 talks about the Davidic empire. Christ comes back to set up his empire. You know, there is not a week I don't read 
online, all the different places I go to read to catch up on the news. It's disconcerting. I mean, isn't it? It's like, it doesn't matter who's voted in. It's a mess. It's a mess. Because you don't see what you're going to see in the kingdom age. Because in the kingdom age, when the Messiah rules and reigns, according to uh, Isaiah 46, 13, when Christ rules and reigns, his kingdom, his worldwide kingdom, will be known for one word, righteousness. What's missing in all of our political empires all throughout the world? None of them are righteous. There might be some good people here and there, but they're not righteous at all. Um, it says in Isaiah chapter 4, verses 3 to 4, that when Christ rules and reigns, holiness will permeate his empire. What's lacking in all of the empires of the world today? <laughs> holiness. Holiness. Um, it says in Zechariah chapter 8, verse 3, when Christ rules and reigns, truth, not falsity, will be the order of the day. What will happen to news in the Messianic kingdom? How could you be a reporter? Well, you've got to report the truth. Is there going to be any fake news in the... In the no. They're only going to tell you the truth. They ain't got no political acts to grind. It's truth is known. I mean, this is, you could go through weeks studying what would the kingdom be like when Christ come back. That's why Christ says, if their rejection resulted in the salvation of Gentiles, what shall it be when they're saved as a people? Well, he's telling you, the kingdom arrives. Awesome. Awesome. Answer number one, is God finished with Israel? No, he's going to take her sin and point it, point it to total belief. Number two, her teachings from the Old Testament point to the fact that they will have ultimate belief. Paul says, uh, think about your own writings if you're a Jew. He says, uh, here's a conditional clause. If the first piece, it's a cooking analogy and a gardening analogy. I love both. Think about it. If the dough, if a piece of dough is holy, then the lump is, is, is also, by definition. And if the root is holy, then the branches are too. So let's look at cooking for just a minute. You're making homemade bread, right? You do this? So what, you don't do this. How many don't do this? Unbelievable. Okay. I used to watch my grandmother do this all the time. And, uh, you know, she would, you know, flour the water and the, all the things, whatever, the milk, whatever, and the yeast and everything that you have to have. And it was like, she didn't use like thermometers or anything. She used the back of her wrist. And I asked her one day as a little kid, because I loved her homemade, oh, it was to die for. And she didn't give anybody the recipe. My mom tried to replicate those biscuits and they came out like cement. That was like the family joke. You could drive nails, mom, with your biscuits. Grandma's biscuits were tall and fluffy. She's like, well, she didn't tell me what she did. And my mom's like, she always used the back of her wrist to test the milk for the right, you know, temperature for the yeast and everything. Okay. And, and so when you look at, a, I watched it as a kid, the, the dough ball in the bowl as it's rising. If you tore off a piece of that, it's got all the components of the main dough ball. And so Paul says, when you think about bread, if you tore off a piece of it, it, that piece represents the rest of it. So since their founders, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, were those who were founded in faith, they were men of faith, great men of faith, since that's how the nation started, and all the unconditional promises through the Abrahamic covenant were given to them, you think God's going to renege on that? No. No. They are merely saying, if they were holy, God's going to make you holy one day. Because you're part of them. And then he said, if you don't understand that, he said, uh, we'll go to a, a gardening analogy. He said, think about an, an olive tree. An olive tree. If the root of an olive tree is holy, then the branches are holy by definition. Right? Uh, <laughs> that's an olive tree. A picture of an olive tree I took in the Garden of Gethsemane a couple years ago. Uh, they said it's estimated to be about 800, 800 years old. Uh, where Christ prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Awesome place to stand. Um, but if that tree has a root system. So if the root system uh, is, is uh, holy, Paul says, in a theological sense, then the tree and the branches by definition are holy. So in the analogy, Israel, he says, you're the branches. And the root system, well, th those are your founders, like Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob. God gave the promises to them to form you into this mighty nation. So if he has to discipline you by cutting you off from the tree because of sin, that doesn't mean that he's finished with you. Have you ever dug up a tree around here only to have it like come back? <laughs> have you done this? Yeah. Now I used to be a tree trimmer, landscaper. I've taken down tons of trees. I don't know where this crepe myrtle came from in my front yard. I didn't plant it there. I don't know if some enemy across the street did. Somebody I don't know. Some bird. I don't even know how this, but the last couple of years, and I have all, in you know, my trees planted, planted, I planted my crepe myrtles. One came up, I didn't plant. I didn't even plant the color. 
And so I got pink ones, and this one comes up lavender. I'm like, what in the world? So the last couple summers, I've just kind of let it do its thing. But it's next to a dogwood that I got shaped into a ball, and it's too close to it. So I had to move it. And so this, this year, I decided it's time to move the crepe myrtle. And so I cut it out, cut out, you know, perimeter, cut out all the roots, dug out the root ball, picked it up, transported it, put it in a symmetrical place next to another crepe myrtle that's pink. And now I got pink and lavender together. It's cool, and I'm happy. So yesterday, I was back trying to fix my yard from the heat wave that fried my yard while I was gone. I mean, the devil is alive and well. So I'm just cutting down everything. Trash can full of, there goes those plants. Uh, and as I was moving through my yard, I looked where the, uh, the tree used to be. And I, about this tall, I see crepe myrtle suckers standing there. They're like mocking me. Yeah. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. It's, this is my sermon in a nutshell. I thought we were done with that crepe myrtle tree. What's God saying? Eh. No, no, there's still life in that. See, this is Israel. God cut off the branches because they sinned. But there's still life down there in that root system because of the faith of those forefathers. This is Paul's argument. How could Paul, how could God be done with his people uh, when the root system was that which he unconditionally loved and gave them his covenant? He's not done with them. He might be disciplining you as a nation in the present, but he's still got great plans for you. Is God finished with Israel? No, no. You should be praying for the peace of Israel. When I go to Israel uh, and you walk into like the garden tomb area of Christ, there's a little sign that says in the rock, it says pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for Israel. Why? Because we're called to pray for them, to reach out to them, uh, for them to be saved. Um, when you look at verse 17, when we get there to the third answer, it's probably one of the more complicated passages of, of the New Testament from my perspective. So I'm not going to say these are, it's a shallow end to dive into. These are problematic verses because what Paul says here, I have read commentary after commentary. I took a Greek exegetical class, my sixth year of Greek, where we went through this with a professor from Cambridge. I, I have been through it. And I can still tell you there is depths to this that are hard to plumb. But what is God saying here? Well, um, let's dig into it. Because here's what he says. In answer number three, is God done with Israel? He's going to say no. Uh, her unbelief is going to point to ultimate belief. But Paul's going to be so excited about talking about the salvation of his nation, he's going to say, I've got to stop and talk to you Gentiles for a second. Because he says, I realize there's a problem with Gentiles. And he's going to tell you two things you need to be paying attention to as a Gentile as you prepare for the salvation of the nation of Israel. First thing is, verses 17 to 22, he says, if you're a Gentile, you should be mindful of your belief while they're unbelieving. Oh, what do you mean? Well, here's what he says. He says, but if some of the branches, the nation, were broken off, and you, as a Gentile, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them and became partaker of the rich root of the olive tree, I have some counsel for you, Paul says. Don't what? Don't be arrogant. Don't be arrogant. Don't be arrogant toward the branches. Don't be arrogant toward the Jewish nation. And then he goes on to say, but if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. I mean, don't think that you don't need them. I mean, I got both of my degrees in the Old Testament. Why? Because I realized I can't understand the New Testament unless I understand the Old Testament. I mean, I owe them everything. Because that's where all the foundation is laid. Paul says, don't get arrogant thinking because it looks like God's done with them that, you, that you're all that now. Don't, don't be cocky in your faith. He said, uh, let me quote something that I hear from Gentiles in verse 19. You will say, quote, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. It's kind of like that. I'm adding to the tone of the text, but it's heavy on the word I. We probably need to read that again, don't we? Because if you read it just straight, it doesn't sound like anything. Branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Okay. But if you put the heavy emphasis on the I, you get the picture? picture? Yeah. It's about time that I, as a goy, as part of the goyim, the Gentiles, was grafted into this thing that God's doing. And because he's grafted me in, that means I am somebody and they're nothing. That's kind of the implication. And Paul says, uh, uh, you're quite right in verse 20 about that. Um, they were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by your faith. But don't be what? Conceited, thinking God's done with them. Uh, but fear, for if God did not spare the natural branches, the Israelites, he will not spare you either. Behold then the kindness and the severity of God. God's kind and he's severe. He's a balance between these two things. Um, he says, uh, think about the severity of God. To those who fell, well, that was severity. But to you, right now, you're seeing God's kindness. Notice the conditional statement. 
Well, you see his, why not, does that translation show it? His kindness, otherwise you whip it up. Okay, well, there's, that's a conditional sentence in the Greek text. It says, you will see God's kindness if you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you will also be cut off. This is most interesting. This leads to three viewpoints. If Paul is telling me as a Gentile to be mindful of my belief and be humble about it while they're in a state of unbelief, he's telling me not to be conceited. And, and if, I, if I get conceited, and if I get into a point of unbelief where I'm anti-Israel, anti-Jew, if I get there, God will cut me off. What does that mean? You have three options. And this is where it gets interesting. You have three options of how to interpret that. You ready? Number one, it refers to believers. They're grafted in. Uh, they're the wild branch. He takes them. He, he, he well, grafts them into the, 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 the stock of Israel. Uh, and when they get to a point of unbelief, he says, if you get to being unbelieving toward me dealing with the Jews, I will cut you off and it's over for you. You just lost your salvation. That biblical? No. No. Because no. if you take that viewpoint, and many do, uh, in fact, I say that's probably the majority viewpoint, I have major issues with it. Because you just denigrated justification by faith. Go back to chapter 8 where Paul says, nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Nothing. Not even you in your sin. Height, breadth, principalities, powers, demons, doesn't matter. Nothing can separate you. And if you go back to chapter uh, 5, he tells you there's, you know, there's no condemnation for you. Chapter 8, he talks about this. There's no condemnation for you who are in Christ Jesus. He doesn't condemn you anymore. You're his child. He has sealed you. You're his child. So I don't think he's talking about a believer getting to the point where they get on the bandwagon of being anti-Israel and he cuts them off and they lose their salvation. I don't think he's talking about salvation there. Number two, second viewpoint. Well, he's talking about the church. The church must stay in a state of belief of God dealing with Israel. If the church at large gets to the point where they reject God's dealing with Israel, God will judge the church and cut the church off and the church will lose out on eternal glory. That sound logical? No. Does God discipline the church? No, absolutely he does. It says so in Revelation 2 to 3. He's the priest, high priest, who walks among the lampstands of each church and he peers into them to see what's commendable, what needs to be dealt with. He's holy. So he does deal with the church, but since we see the church in Revelation 19 coming back with Jesus when he returns at the end of the tribulation, he, they're not cut off. So I don't think he's talking about the church, which leads us to view three. I think Paul is speaking here to unbelieving Gentiles. Unbelieving Gentiles who get the opportunity to get in on the Abrahamic promise that was given to Abraham years ago that God would use the Jews to bless the entire world. And he says, you've been given a special privilege through Israel's rejection that God has given you the opportunity uh, that you can follow that Messiah and, and he will give you the Abrahamic promises in the kingdom when it comes. But if you adopt unbelief and you turn against his people, he will look down at you and he will cut you off and you will not be a participant in his empire, his kingdom, ever. Now that's, that view is not without issues either because he does say that these people become part of that main trunk of Israel by faith. So this is problematic. So I say it's not airtight, but I have too many issues with view one and two, uh, theologically speaking. I think he's speaking about view three. I just, I'm not totally understanding how he connects all the dots there. But I think he's talking about Gentiles because he's talking about the root of the nation, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and them blessing the world. So I think it's a warning to Gentiles not to turn against his chosen people lest he judge you. I mean, it's the basic form of what he's saying. Before his people, not against his people, lest he judge. So be mindful of your unbelief, uh, of their unbelief while you are believing. Number two, he says, he closes by saying, be watchful in your belief during their unbelief. Verse 23 says, and they also, if, if they do not continue in their unbelief, they will be grafted in back into the trunk of Israel for God is able to graft them in again. I mean, why? Well, they were the natural branches. If when you had an olive tree and you wanted it to stay productive over the years, you grafted in new young olive branches and made it fruitful. God says, I'm going to do something amazing. I'm going to take a wild olive branch that's not fruitful, Gentiles. I'm going to cut off my people temporarily. And I'm going to graft in the Gentiles. I'm going to do something that you don't do in working with trees. And I'm going to make the Gentiles fruitful because I can. But he tells the Gentiles, be watchful. 
Because in verse 24, he says, For if you were cut off from that which is by nature a wild olive tree, and you were grafted in contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? He says, they shall. So he says, be watchful that one day the Messiah will graft them back in again. Is God finished with Israel? No. He says, one day he'll be done with you Gentiles. We'll get to this next week. And he's going to graft them back in. There was a, a man years ago. His name was uh, Joseph Rabinovitz, uh, a Jew from Russia, who was told by Jewish friends in Russia, travel to Israel, buy us some land in the, ho- land in the Holy Land. So he went. He, and they, before he left, they gave him a copy of the New Testament. And they said, uh, we've heard that this has great descriptions of Jerusalem uh, that will help you understand what you're looking at. So just take this book and you might get some value out of it from an archaeological perspective. So he took it. And he went to Israel and he traveled around and he bought land for his friends in Russia, uh, his other Jewish friends. And then when he was finished, he went and he sat down on the Mount of Olives. I've been there. Mount of Olives. It overlooks uh, the Kidron Valley and the Temple Mount and Golgotha. And as he sat there, wind whipping through his hair, he asked this one question. God, why are my people persecuted so? He began to read through that New Testament that he had in his hand. Gospel story. He was up there for quite a while as he read. When he got finished with the story, he answered his question. And he said, the reason why we're persecuted is we've rejected our Messiah. But now I know who the Messiah is. He then raised his hands to the heaven. And he said, you are my Lord and my God. He went up the Mount of Olives, a person who didn't walk with the Messiah. He came down from the Mount of Olives, a man who did, based upon the the word of the gospel story. He is Joseph Rabinovitz, a mere uh, small taste of what God's going to do when he redeems his people, Israel. Is he finished with them? No. Uh, Our culture's going off the deep end on that one. God says we as his people should support what he's doing and he's all for them because he's not finished with them and neither should we be. Let's pray. God, thank you uh, for the, just the power of the word of God. It helps us to see how we should think about even the world affairs about us. Might we be for what you are doing with Gentiles and with your Jewish nation and that might our prayer be for their salvation and might our example be that to where they get saved by our example in Christ's name, amen.